chapter 8, uh, and then I'm going to immediately throw a curve at you and tell you we're going to look at uh, the end of chapter 7. So uh, that's tough if you have an electronic Bible. So, you know, uh, a lot of preachers spend their Saturdays prepping for Sunday. You know, they tweak their sermon, you know, different things like that. Um, you know, they meditate, they, you know, they, again, they just work on their sermon. And I spend a lot of time thinking about my sermon on, on Saturday, but, uh, um, you know, still interact with Suzanne or work in my shed or do something along that line. Well, yesterday the preparation was, uh, we went to the Parthenon and, uh, and uh, got to see the goddess Athena. And, and so um, that may sound like, um, well, that's idolatry. Keep that in mind for the sermon. But it was kind of interesting to go to this recreation of something that's in Greece and, uh, and to go inside the second floor there and see this giant statue to Athena, uh, which I, I found out something, um, that one, a couple of movies have actually been filmed there. And uh, how many Percy Jackson fans are there in this crowd? Christopher, I thought you would raise your hand. And did I, was that Destiny I saw over here? Yeah, yeah. So I'm a Percy Jackson fan. I mean, I'm thinking, you guys are too old for me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm supposed to be, yeah. Yeah, so go ahead. Romans chapter 7. Uh, I, I just want to uh, deal with a, uh, uh, a backup verse. Just, just to uh, give us a little background. This is Romans chapter 7, verses 24 and 25. And if you'll remember, as we've gone through this, um, the theme that we're on was started in Romans chapter 5. And then in Romans chapter 6, Paul asks a question, and the question was quite simply, shall we go on sinning all the more so that grace may increase? And all he's been doing all this time, you know, and, and we spent weeks on it, all he's been doing is answering that question. Because it is such an issue in the Christian life. You know, how do you, how do you deal with sin in your life? And there's things that you, chapter 7 was very much this, there's things you want to do for God, and yet you fail miserably so many times. So what's the secret? Uh, he, he answers, in chapter 6, he asks the question not once but twice, and he answers it the same way twice, and that is, no, you don't keep on sinning all the more so grace may increase. This is the end of chapter 7, and notice the anguish that he has here. You know, there's victory and there's anguish. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he's talking about our physical bodies. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. And that seems to be where so many of us are at. Are you like that? Do you struggle with that? Are you one of those folks that uh, uh, maybe you don't have one of the big sins, but it could be something that's just uh, uh, a little more than an annoying habit? In traffic, do you find yourself too many times uh, sending up the one finger salute to somebody? You know, uh, are, are you is is anger an issue? Uh, do you struggle with anger? We'll talk a little bit about uh, a gal later on who has an anger issue, and, uh, and and just that that schism that we have, that battle that goes on within us that just says. Um, man, uh, am I going to put all this to death? Uh, here's the thing to remember about chapter 8. I love chapter 8. We're going to spend several weeks on chapter 8. And this is what I would like for you to hear. It's a victory chapter. You end on the note of victory. As a matter of fact, uh, Paul ends with this unusual term. It's not referring to tennis shoes. Uh, it's two words uh, that are combined. It's conjunction. 
and it's Hooper Nike. Nike is not the tennis shoes. Nike is the goddess of victory. So it is kind of interesting that I was spending time in a recreation of a Greek temple with the goddess Athena yesterday, and yet the term that Paul uses here is victory. We are super, mega, immense conquerors in Christ. So that's where we're going to go. Uh, let's look at uh, chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Here's your hope. So just a, a little background on this next screen. Uh, this is what's going on in, particularly in chapter, uh, in verse 1. Uh, katakrima is the Greek word there. Katakrima, it's only used three times in the book of Romans. And, and, and it's, a, it's a judicial term. It, it, it deals with the laws in the courts or with forensics. And it has to do with you to judge someone as definitely guilty and thus subject to punishment, to condemn, to render a verdict of guilt, condemnation. So that's the no condemnation. That's the condemnation part. But look at what's next. Next screen. It's no condemnation. It, it's the, the word that Paul uses here is not just no in a lightweight sense. And one of the things to remember about Greek is Greek has this huge vocabulary. In Hebrew, there's only about 2,000 words that are used in the entire Hebrew Old Testament, 39 books, 2,000 vocabulary words. You get to Greek, and there's 8,000 Greek vocabulary in the New Testament. It's amazing the difference. And so when Paul in particular uses a word, you have to ask yourself, why? And this word, no, doesn't just mean no. It means no, not one. So if you are in Christ Jesus, no one can bring up a charge against you. Not one. That's immense. What's Paul trying to do? He's trying to give us hope. He's trying to give us, he's trying to point us to uh, just what we have in Christ and a way out of this battle between our flesh and our spirit. So the, what's the title today? The Victory of Grace Over Sin. Becoming, by the way, man or, uh, since it's a mixed crowd, women of the spirit. Do you get that? Verse 3. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, and remember his big, uh, his big teaching. Here's the law. You have the law. It shows you what we need to do in order to get to heaven. It shows us how we need to measure up. But what weakens the law? The law cannot do something and it cannot overcome our flesh. We, by, as human nature, have a tendency. You create this line in the sand, guess what human beings are going to do? They're going to say, can I go that much farther? I would, just so you understand how you are. I would, I would recommend that anybody teach in school. Then you understand human nature. Because all young people are is little models of ourselves. They just don't have the filters that we do. So they don't know that what they're, you know, we, we tend to wear masks and we cover it up and we've gotten pretty good at it. The older we are, the better we are at covering up our sins. Because we know what we're doing is wrong, but what do we not want to do? We don't want to show our hand that we're imperfect in any way. That's human, human beings. You go to kids, kids don't know. They, what you see is what you get. So you make a rule with a kid, and guess what happens? Okay, you have to be home by 11. Well, what happens if I'm home by 11 or 1? See what I mean? That's human nature. And that's the law. So basically, we as kids, you know, we see the law and we say to God, oh really? Well, what if, and that's what we do, for God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. 
And how did he do that? By sending his own son. In the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemns sin in the flesh. In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Do you get it? Now I'm going to warn you right here. We need to pay attention to how our English Bibles translate. Okay, and y'all, I'll show you a little bit later on where we've got a difficulty. But uh, look at the beauty of God's grace. I mean, just pay attention to what those verses just told us. So, here's this rebellious populace. These people that God created in his own image. And, and uh, you know, I've got a friend, Jeff Allen, who, a uh, comedian, we, we uh, brought him into Lewistown to do a, a show one time. He's a great Christian comedian. But he has a great line. I love it. He says, teenagers are God's way of, sh of showing us what he feels like. How, you know, that we get to know what, it, what it's like to create something in our own image that denies us later on. I thought that was the. I thought that was uh, feedback from the microphone. It's actually a helicopter going. Do <laughs> you get that? So we're being spied on by them. So here we are denying God. We're rebellious. We're thumbing our noses at Him, and uh, and He creates the law and says, "Live up to it." And we still rebel and still rebel and still rebel. He even picks out a chosen people that he gives the law to. And their entire history is nothing but a history of rebellion. So then he shows us the greatest example of love and grace. He sends a son who doesn't just come as a missionary. No, he actually lives like us. He takes on flesh. He lives with all the insecurities, and, and I, 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 I'm a history buff, and I just, I, you know, for those of us who have done short-term mission trips into foreign countries, and you see how third world countries live, just remember, Jesus came to one of the most sophisticated countries on the planet 2,000 years ago, and they had trenches through the streets that carried the sewage. If you wanted to go to the grocery store, you didn't go, and it wasn't your meat wasn't formed in a little uh, cubicle in the back that they wrapped plastic on, and you know, uh, and, and no animal died. No, you went down to the temple, and you got to hear the screams of the animals as they harvested them, and you would go, and the, the animal would be hanging up there. And you say, "I like that piece right there," and they'd hack it off for you, and you'd go home and scrape off some of the mold. You know, uh, if you cut your hand and, and there was no such thing as, as cleanliness, not like the way we know today, and it gets infected, you didn't run down to the doctor in the hospital. Um, I mean, it was primitive. God chose that time to send his son to show us love and grace. And it wasn't just that. I mean, think about the beauty of grace. He sent Jesus at a time when people were particularly brutal to one another. Human life could be bought with some coins. A parent could stand in front of a newborn child, deny that child, and they would take that child out of the city gates, lay it outside the city gates, and let it die on its own. We take and watch the news and we think we have brutality now. You have no conception of what brutality is in this purified, sanctified, uh, widefied society that we live in. We have no idea. And yet God chose that time to send his son. The rest of the story to do what we could not do, what we refused to do. He lived a perfect life and then died on a cross and didn't just do that. He took every sin that every human being has ever done, every sin that you are doing now, and every sin that you will continue to do, and he 
he paid the price for it. Now that's love. Do you see the beauty of God's grace? Do you see where Paul is going? This is a great chapter. So, as Mike Kimball catches up, number one, what's Paul teaches just in those verses? God frees us from sin's power, but also sin's penalty. We don't have to worry about where we're going. But let's go on, he gets better. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it, what's the word? Cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, there, unfortunately, there is a second point here. This is not a fun point, but for those for those who struggle with uh, Christian sinning, you have to remember something about this passage. This passage is written to Christians. But it's a warning to Christians about continuing to live after the Spirit. It is still answering the questions in Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Shall we go on sinning all the more so that, so that grace may increase? No! It's pretty emphatic. He's still answering that question. And he says, if you are guided by the flesh, what? It's bad. <coughs> It's bad, bad, bad news. You cannot please God. So there is bad news in the good news, unfortunately. Romans 8, verse 9. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if in fact the Spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. You get that? That's good news. Um, but you better check yourself before you wreck yourself. You know what? Uh, this is a test uh, verse. This is one of those things where it says, okay, uh, you're going to church, yeah. Uh, you, you're, I mean, you're showing up on a regular basis, but uh, you're, still, I mean, you're still struggling with living life the way God wants you to live. You better check yourself. Because you're either a man of the spirit or you're a man of the flesh. You can't be both. You got it? So you better check yourself. Now, I want you to see this picture. This gal made it in the news this past Monday. Do you remember that? Did you see that video? I thought it was awesome. Here's this little gal. Uh, she, uh, here's what happened. There's some folks at a, uh, at, you know, at a shopping center down in Alabama. And, uh, and they see a gal get out and go and uh, take a shovel to the windshield of a Volvo. And then she, she gets out after she's cracked the windshield on the Volvo with the shovel. You'll see why in just a second. She, she goes and she starts to stop out the windshield. If you watch the video, she flashes a guy who's there photographing her with a, uh, with a, a cell phone. And, and everybody, oh, you, you see it. I mean, she's cute, isn't she? Uh, pay attention, though, to the height. She's only five foot four. She's only five foot four. And she's stomping out the windshield of this Volvo, and she stomps it out. She gets arrested. Why is she arrested? Well, there is a difference of opinion, but apparently this guy is at least a friend. And he did one of two things. Uh, such is the story of arrest records. He either uh, broke her John Mayer um, CD, or there was a love triangle. Um, I don't want to be judgmental, but I'm just thinking, number one, you're in a relationship with that guy, and he cheats on you, Praise God. You know? <laughs> Run. Leave. Vamos. No. Here's what she did. She 
you know, she, what, whatever the indiscretion is, breaking a CD, really? And so he, she does, not only tries to smash out his windshield, she hops on top of his sunroof and tries to smash out his sunroof, but at five foot four, she can't do that. She didn't have the shovel with her at that time. This is what made me think of today's sermon. And God's so great about illustrations. She prayed first. <laughs> she, she prayed first. Did you, did you catch that? She prayed the night before. And she wouldn't fall and pray for No, about what to do. <laughs> she prayed the night before, slept on it after a night of prayer, woke up the next morning and decided, decided it was a bad idea. And then you know what she says? No. Then I saw the shot. <laughs> Why do I use this illustration? I use this illustration um, such as human nature. You know, I can have a uh, I can have a bumper sticker on my car that says "Praise Jesus," play, uh, and please take off your Plateau Christian Church sticker if you've. Uh, uh, well, take off the Praise Jesus sticker and take off the Plateau Christian Church sticker. If you're one of these people that here you are filled with Jesus, filled with the Holy Spirit on Sunday, you get in your car to drive to work on Monday morning, somebody cuts you off and you do. Um, it's, that's the shovel, isn't it? You can spend all your day in prayer. You can fill yourself with sanctification and righteousness and whatnot. But then that man of the flesh appears and steals your heart. I, I want you to think about how we are as human beings. I, I, I equate it to, well, I've discovered in living here, you guys get a lot of rain. <laughs> I can tell you about snow. After the last 11 years, I can tell you about snow. I was telling a young fellow this morning that, I've, again, I've seen it snow 12 out of 12 months in Montana in two different years. I've been in July watching the snow fall. I mean, it's crazy. But you guys get rain. I, I mean, just from, from Thursday until yesterday, I had two inches at my house. Have you ever thought that God's blessings are like rain, but we're raining grace for, you know, another way to think of it. It's like rain in Kool-Aid. And we ought to be out there with buckets and barrels. And we go out with forks. Such is the nature of grace. We spend so much time talking about it, doing it, but we don't plug into the man of the Spirit. Do you get that? So... Oh, my Kindle turned off. Now I have to turn it on. You guys have to wait for me to say something and sip it and catch up. So now listen. Look at what happens next. Verse 10. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now, next screen, real quick. I want you to, uh, this is what I was referring to earlier. In the original Greek, there was not a distinction between letters. If you take and you read the original text, it is just one endless line of letters. There's no punctuation, there's no chapters, there's no verse, there's no dots, there's no commas. None of that exists, but not only that, there is not a big letter and a small letter. So you get very good, if, you're, if you can read Greek, you get very good at picking out the words. Believe it or not, your mind adjusts, and you can do it. You can find the words in an original Greek document. You see them. But on something like this, what we do not know, unless we pay attention to the passage, and, and let's look at that verse 10 again. What we do not know is, is that a small s or a big s when it talks about the Spirit? 
and there's a good argument for either one. I lean towards small s because of the context of the passage. Look at it this way. But if Christ is in you, although this body is dead because of sin, and when I die, you know what? It's going to disintegrate. Some of us, some of us have so gotten over it, we're, we're not afraid of, of uh, you know, um, having our, our bodies cremated. Because this is, this is just temporary. And it is prone to sin. But because of Jesus Christ living in us, the Spirit is alive. The Spirit within us. And I think it lends itself to that. It's still difficult translation. And I'm not saying they're wrong and I'm right. But I think that's a better interpretation. Your spirit is alive because Christ dwells within you. Now I've got a young lady who's going to come up and her story is tailor made for this. She knows what this struggle is like. We heard it this morning. I just want her to share it again. My name is Sarah Myers. I'm 29 years old and I was born and raised here in Crossville, Tennessee. I grew up in a home that was dysfunctional to say the least. My mom was an alcoholic and she struggled with depression, schizophrenia, and bipolar as long as I can remember. When I was eight years old, I celebrated my birthday with her in Moccasin Bend and she didn't know who I was. When I was 11, my dad got remarried and left me feeling abandoned and rejected. And I started reaching out for attention through boys and smoking pot and finding acceptance with the other broken kids and the other broken homes. After that, I started running around with all of those kids that were broken too, and I started to smoke pot, then I started to drink, and then I started to take pills, and then I started to do meth. And so at 15 years old, I met a, a guy that I thought that I was going to be in love with for the rest of my life. He was about four or five years older than me, and he was into much harder drugs than I realized. I got pregnant, and at six and a half months pregnant, I lost the baby due to a rare cervix disorder, and he lived for two minutes. And after this, I started doing drugs in a way I had never done them before, in a needle. And so at 15 years old, I became a needle junkie. I didn't know Jesus. He wasn't introduced to me as a child. He wasn't introduced to me as a teenager, so I didn't know him. So I didn't know any other way but to go with the flow and follow the crowd. And so after I got strung out on the needle at 15 years old, um, I just my life continued to spiral, spiral out, of, out of control. And that started a 12, 13 year, 12 to 13 year addiction of pain pills and meth. And so in between that 12 and 13 years, I had a clean break for, well, not a clean break, I wasn't clean. I had a, a, a moment of functioning addiction for about three or four years where I had three more children that I raised for four years. And I was doing pain pills the whole time and I was functioning doing pain pills the whole time. Not because I had a prescription or because I was in pain, just because I was addicted. And so I postponed the, the worst addiction, which was the IV addiction, for three or four years, raised my children for a little while, but I was still dying inside. I was still broken inside. I was still trying to numb the pain that was going on for me as a child. I still struggled with depression and insecurity, and I still tr struggled with rejection, and I didn't think I had a choice but to struggle that way. I thought that was going to be my life for the rest of my life. And so after raising my kids for four years, um, I started shooting up again. And it wasn't too long after that. Uh, there was a year that went by when I had my daughter in October. Two months, or two weeks after I had my daughter, my brother killed himself. Our house burnt two weeks later, and then my dad died on my birthday six days later. My dad was my best friend. Six months later, um, I lost my children to DCS custody. Um, we were arrested for manufacturing. Me and their dad went to jail for manufacturing men. 
We were cooking meth and selling meth and running for it. It was taking over our life. And so our kids went into, into state's custody, and I tried to get them back for eight months, but the pain of abandoning them and the guilt and the shame of leaving them almost killed me. And instead of motivating it, me to do the right thing, the pain was unbearable and it caused me to do the wrong thing. And so I just went further into addiction. And then my rights were terminated. And so I was arrested over 26 times. I was tased twice. And I was out of control. I couldn't stop it. That was all I knew. I just couldn't stop it. I couldn't get to Jesus. I wanted it to stop. But I didn't know how to make it stop. So in March of 2013, God stepped into my life with handcuffs and a black suit. I got arrested for the very last time. I was ready to go to jail. I was very tired of running. And I was very sick and tired of being sick and tired. When I went to jail, after a couple of weeks, um, my mind started to clear up a little bit. And I started to take a 12-step class on Tuesdays, jail ministry class. And uh, God's love was planted inside of me. And from there, it, it started to grow. The seed started to grow. And I uh, started to seek out who God was. And in the midst of me being in jail, serving a year, and my rights being terminated, I came back from my termination hearing after six hours of sitting in court, hearing about what I wasn't and how I was a terrible mother. I came back to my pod and I hit my knees and I said, God, if you don't show me who you are, I'm not going to make it. All these people tell me that you're real. Show me that you're real. And it says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. And so three days went by after my rights were terminated to my children, and I woke up and I had this peace that passes all understanding. I couldn't explain it. I, I, I just knew it had nothing to do with my circumstances. All I knew is that I had peace of mind, and a thousand pounds had been lifted off of me. And when you don't know peace, you recognize it when you receive it. And so I started to go after what God had for me because he made himself so real to me. I asked the courts to go into Teen Challenge, and they allowed me to go. Originally, they told me I was going to prison, and when I went to court the day to get approved to go to Teen Challenge, the, the judge that was going to send me to prison, he woke up with the flu, and there was a sit-in judge. And so they approved me to go to Teen Challenge. During my time as a student, I was healed from insecurity and depression and why I used to begin with. Um, I, it wasn't the fact that I had a drug addiction, I had a heart problem. And so my drug addiction was a side effect of my heart problem. So I stayed in Louisiana Teen Challenge for two and a half years, getting healing, finding out who I was in Christ. And I came back to visit, and I felt God called me back here for a mission to come and help people that was just like me. And so I moved back here in September of 2015, and now I have a program called Invitation Ministries. And we help people go into long-term programs, and we help people with transitional living and 